Blessings, friends, and welcome to this edition of Spotlight on Music. I'm your host, Bishop Andre Woods. And listen, friends, I want you to know we're going to have a glorious, blessed time tonight with our special guest. What I want you to do as we prepare for this interview tonight, I want you to like and share, tag your friends, start your own watch party. We're on Facebook, Fellowship of Music and Arts page, Bishop Andre S. Woods page. We kind of spread around. You ought to be able to find us tonight. And I want you to share. You'll be able to send thumbs up, jump in the comment section, greet our guests. Uh, if you got questions, we welcome you to sign in and share your questions and uh, be a part of what's going on here tonight. We are so excited and so elated uh, for the woman of God that's going to be sharing with us tonight. And I want you uh, to prepare your hearts uh, as we just give a little information of her background. And then we're going to start our interview for this evening. Uh, Elder Linnell Andrews, professional organist, keyboardist, music producer, musical director, and songwriter for over 30 years, played in many musical environments, churches, arenas, major stages, in and out of the United States, originating in New York City, resides in New Jersey, specializing in gospel, house, R&B, and more. A music teacher uh, for East Orange School District for 20, four years, and an extraordinary uh, musician, pianist, and organist. Uh, I've had the chance to witness her music in person at the Gospel Music Workshop of America. And certainly, friends, I want you to help me welcome our guests to this platform, a spotlight on music, the one and only Elder Linnell Andrews. Blessings, my sister. Happy to have you with us. God bless you, Bishop. So Listen, glad to be here. I'm humbled and honored to be here. Oh, it's a joy to have such a woman of your caliber on to help make us all look good. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, in this thing called gospel music. Amen. Listen, 
uh, your, 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 your background, your accolades, and all that you do, I'm sure, is much more than uh, these few lines that you share. Uh, friends, she, she's so modest and so humble. And, uh, but her musicianship is second to none. Uh, and I'm talking musician to musician and to other musicians that's listening. Those of you who know her through the Gospel Music Workshop of America and even in her church and other places. Listen, I, I want you to share with us uh, how you got started in music, how it grabbed your interest and uh, you took off running with it and the rest is history. Just give us a little background of your story. Well, um, very humble beginnings. Uh, I was brought up in the Baptist church in Harlem, Mount Ebenezer Baptist church. Uh, the pastor was my uncle, Reverend Lafayette Rogers. Um, my mom is his, was his sister. So of course, you know, I was at everything, all services, Sunday school, BTU, all of that. I, I was drunk to church. <laughs> That's the story of my life. Been in church my whole life. Um, even though it, it was a small church as far as size, uh, my uncle had a very large, um, what's the word I could say, uh, imagination for what he expected of the church. Um, as far as how it looked, how it was, how it was run, run um, program-wise, music. Um, we had a, a wide variety of music. I was raised around a wide variety of different genres of gospel music back in those days in the, uh, the 60s. Um, uh, what's, the, what's the genre? Um, spirituals. Spirituals were very prevalent in my church. Um, anthems, very prevalent. We didn't have a hammond. I didn't know what a hammond organ was until my teenage years because we had a, a Wurlitzer. It looks like a hammond, the wood, the, the body, the casing looks like a hammond, but actually it's um, uh, set up to sound like a pipe organ. So I was really trained to play pipe organ. My mother made me take lessons for pipe organ. Um, I forgot the man's name. Oh, this came to me, Mr. Vincent. He was a widely known um, organist back in, in Harlem in those days. And he used to play at our church. And my mother asked him to give me lessons for playing pipe. And um, I learned how to play with two feet, which was very odd. Um, but I realize now the importance of learning how to play with both of your feet. Um, but how it started was, my mother made me take lessons because I was about four years old. And after our morning service, there was some uh, afternoon service that was going on. So you went downstairs to eat between the services as we usually do. And I was playing on the old upright that was uh, in the basement of our church in the lower level. And whatever I was doing, it must have sounded like music, I guess, because the whole uh, congregation of people that were eating, they stopped eating and were, and were looking towards me. So I'm saying, well, what did I do? I stopped playing and somebody yelled out to, to my mother because her name is Metarine Ware. And somebody said, Met, because they called her Met. You better get that girl some lessons. So about six months later, I was getting lessons. Uh, I remember I was five years old. So that happened in like the winter, so in the spring of the next year, I was getting lessons and I was very upset because my friends were outside and I was downstairs playing and learning how to play the piano. And I could hear them running up and down the driveway and up and down the street and I was upset. But now I understand what she was trying to instill in me and I'm so appreciative to her because I can read music. A lot of my peers who are very highly gifted, they do not read music. But I do thank God that he allowed me to learn the importance of reading music, music theory, and all that comes with it because you're more valuable. Um, some might say that's not really true, but I think that you're more valuable when you know how to read 
as well as play by ear. Um, to make this, my story is very long, but I'm gonna keep it moving. Uh, I remember, I think I was about nine or 10 years old. This lady, her name was Sister Let. Very funny name, we used to laugh at her because her name was Let, L-E-T. <laughs> you know how kids are, you laugh. But anyway, uh, she was one of the few in our church that was prophetic. Now you don't find many churches in the 60s that in the Baptist church where you have people that would speak in tongues or, you know, or prophesy. But she had that. And um, she pulled me to the, to the side one day. We were playing. They were having prayer Bible class. And we were in the vestibule of the church. This is on 8th Avenue, 132nd Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, what was the address of my church? I got to say. 2455 8th Avenue facing 132nd Street. It's now called Frederick, Frederick Lewis, Frederick Douglass Boulevard. And we were playing in the vestibule. And then when she came out, I guess to go to the restroom or something, my friends, they ran out the door and I was busted. I just stayed there. And she said to me, why are you hanging out with these heathens? You know, funny. You know, God's got a calling on your life. Now I'm nine years old. I don't know anything about callings. And she said, I see, I see you playing for big choirs and being in big churches. You know, I'm afraid of, afraid of her because she's talking like that. And I think about that day and I look back on my life and I think about all the many places that I've been, that I have been afforded to uh, play for choirs, for preachers, um, to tour. And I look back and I think about that prophecy she said to me back in those days that she saw me playing for big choirs and being in big churches on big stages. And I thought that to be so amazing that God would think that much of me to warn me or to alert me of what he had in store for me. Um, so moving on, you know, there's a lot of stuff go, that's going on in between, but moving on, um, I realized that I loved music and that it was a passion for me in my, young, in my youth. And I remember listening to, um, there's a station in New York called WQXR they play classical music. And the classical music is my favorite genre on, over gospel, over gospel. And as a child, I would have my mother turn to WQXR so I could hear, uh, what's the man's name? Very famous organist from back in those days, played the pipe organ. Um, mm, 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 can't call his name. But anyway, every Sunday at a certain time after we come home from church, I think it was around eight o'clock, it would be the hour of the pipe organ. And um, this gentleman would play and I was spellbound from listening to him play. And then I started listening and asking my mother to turn to different stations so I could hear other classical stations. Um, so I would try to emulate what I hear. Of course, it wouldn't sound like that, but you know, trying to do like runs and arpeggios, it sound like mess, but um, Classical music was my first love. And then I used to listen to, my mother would have on um, WWRL 1600. Uh, a lot of New York and New Jersey knows about WWRL. And they used to play um, Frankie Crocker and all those names from back in the day. But they used to have this um, segment on Sundays with Alfred Bolden. You ever heard of Alfred Bolden? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he will always come on playing uh, when you hear my horn blowing. And before he would talk, they will always play this one song. And I would say, one day I'm gonna play the organ like that. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. You know, I still didn't know anything about the Hammond organ. All I knew was the Whirlister and the ball. When, when they got rid of the Whirlister, they got a ball one, you know, to sound like the pipe. But when I finally got in front of a Hammond, I didn't understand what it was. You know, the draw, like behind me, the Hammond here, the draw bars is so different than the tabs for the pipe. And um, I asked a young man, I asked my mother, could I ask 
the person that was playing, my uncle had to preach somewhere. And I asked, could I see that organ and touch it? Because I wanted to touch it because the sound was coming out of it that I never heard before. <laughs> and the sound came out and he was explaining to me, he was young. I was about 12 or 13. I remember I was 12 or 13 and he was about 16 or something like that. And I was amazed because he was young playing. And he said, these are called draw bars. And um, he started demonstrating. And I said, one day I'm gonna learn how to play that organ. Cause I could play, I could read the music, you know, the anthems and the spirituals and I could play with both feet, but I couldn't do that. I could not hear. Um, but what opened my ears up was starting opening up my ears was listening to my mother's uh, Clara Ward albums and Mahalia Jackson albums. So I would start trying to play what they were playing, but it sounded like mess. And I've asked God to touch my mind and my brain that I can understand what's going on. Cause I didn't say, how, what is the concept? How are they doing that with these black and white notes? How are they making music like that? And uh, I remember my mother used to always watch Reverend Ike. If anybody from back in the day, you know who Reverend Ike is. Yeah. And um, our church was down. We were in the, the, the 130s of Harlem. And he was up in the 175th or something like that, the palace. So my mother would take me to his church and we would see the, the miracles, signs and wonders. And I said to myself, well, I want, I want that. I want a miracle. So one day she was listening to him on the radio and he was talking about, if you want a miracle in your life, there's something you want God to do, da, 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 da. So I told my mom, I said, mommy, I want a miracle. I'm going to send my money. So I said, I put $2 in the, in the envelope and she put it, she addressed it, put his name on it, whatever the address was and sent it. And I was believing God that he was going to touch my mind and my hands that I will understand what this gospel music is that I could not formulate. And I would say some years later, um, one of my friends from our church, he started hanging around a, a, a deliverance church, quote unquote, holding this church. This mm -hmm. is in the 70s. I'm moving swiftly because there's a lot of in between, but I don't want to take a lot of time. Oh, uh -huh. um, so I snuck away. I was about, say, 16, 17, snuck away from my church. And I told my mother, I'm going with Roland. We're going to go down over on, on Lenox Avenue on 131st. And um, the name of the church was the Move of God Bible Deliverance Church. The pastor was Bishop Robert McEwen, Jr., because his father was a bishop years ago. And the first time I, I walked in that door, all I felt was I didn't have no, I didn't have the Holy Ghost then. I was saved. I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't have the Spirit of God. But when I walked in, I felt this like presence like you could cut it with a knife people were praising and jumping and shouting I'd never saw that way of praise before I said hmm I like this and then when they started singing and the organ um the young man that was playing the organ his name was uh Sput can't call his last name right now many years ago he started playing I said that's that sound I want that and I became friends with those people with some of the members and I used to hang around them all the time. Now, during that process of me learning about the Holy Ghost, because I was learning about the Holy Ghost now, speaking in tongues through, through this um, Sanct Deliverance Church, um, I started studying on my own and reading the scriptures for myself. And I started challenging my uncle and he was like, he didn't like that. He told me that, that tongues wasn't, uh, it's not necessary. And, you need to, don't need to be hanging around those people and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I stopped trying to challenge him. I just left it alone. He believes what he believes, but I know what I know because I've seen it in action. I started seeing uh, uh, people being healed and miracles. So we're not doing this at my church. But anyway, long story short, during this time, I'm still active at my church. I was active in the, in the district the associations, you know, I became the president of our youth department for the United Missionary Association. I used to go to the retreats, the Baptist retreats, the National Baptist, the Lot Carries, the all of that. Been to all of that. Um, 
but I wasn't satisfied. I loved hearing the choir sing. I even joined the, um, the United Missionary uh, Mass Choir um, under the leadership of, uh, what was her name? Dr. Eugenia Moore. And that's why I really learned the importance of the anthems and the spirituals. It was just mind blowing to me. So I, I wanted to do both. I wanted to do gospel. I wanted the, that the Holy Ghost sound as well as the classical because I loved it all. Um, so I've started trying to play both at the same time. I'm trying to learn classical as well as learn, learn the gospel, um, which led me to uh, being a part of a community choir. And our choir was really amazing. I can't even call the name of the choir right now, but I became a director of this choir. And that's how I started, was directing this choir. And then later on, I said, I really have to learn how to play this music. So in 1976, hold on one second, my sister is, uh, hold on one second. Um, in 1976, I was dating this young man. He was a, a preacher. Uh, I was about 18, 19. This is, my mother had passed away. And I was about 19, I think. And I started really um, fellowshipping with Pentecostal churches because I wanted to learn that, that culture. I won't say way of life, but that culture. I wanted that culture. And I wanted the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was, I moved to the Bronx. After my mother passed away, I moved to the Bronx, um, to my godmother's house. And my the pastor of the church at that time was Pastor Ada Sproul. She started this church. We were all out of Baptist churches and we all met each other through this one church, um, the move of God. And she had left her church to be a member of that church. And some of her family members followed her and long story short, you know, I became friends with them. And eventually I moved to the Bronx because um, some family struggles, I was going through it and I had to leave. So he walked, he brought me home. You know, we, New Yorkers, we always on the train or the bus. So to make sure I was safe, he brought me home and he wanted to pray before he left. So we're standing in a circle and he said, if there's anything that you want from God, you know, just believe it. Cause I had been on my own when I lived in Queens in my house, getting on my knees and calling Jesus and tarrying. So I'm gonna get this thing called the Holy Ghost. So we had prayer and then, you know, they were praising and worshiping. And I just was praising my hands. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. hallelujah. You know how we do trying to tarry for the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a flash of light. All I can remember is a flash of light came across my eyes and my eyes were closed. And I didn't know I dropped down to the floor, but I heard this voice speaking in these unknown tongues. And when I came to myself, I realized it was me speaking in the Lord's tongue. And I received the Holy Ghost in the house at 869 uh, South Prospect Street in the Bronx, in the living room. That's why I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And from that day, is when my ears kind of like opened up to music. I started understanding. I said, oh, that's why I do this. And this is why you do that. And, you know, so on my own, you know, I didn't have anybody to really teach me. I didn't have any money like that back in those days. Um, I would take these odd jobs and the money, little money I, I would get, I would try to get lessons of my own. I went to this one school, um, the jazz school of music in Midtown Manhattan. I went to another school, uh, music school. Uh, guys, I, I can hear you. Um, uh, New, York, New York School of the Arts, something like that. It's a long time ago. So I was going everywhere I could to, to learn how to read as well as get my ear together. As I was doing that in the evenings, I was going to different churches, going to revivals so I can listen and hear this sound and be involved in this worship. Eventually, I left my, my uncle's church. Um, and I totally became a member of um, Christ's Supernatural Temple of Deliverance that um, Pastor Ada Spool was the pastor. And we pretty much were the charter members. We were all young. 
I think I was about 20. The rest were teenagers, some were older. Pastor Sproul was a year older than me. And I learned so much spiritually and prophetically by being in that ministry. Mm -hmm. And that's when the music really started pouring into me. Um, I, we formed a choir called the, the um, uh, Voices of Deliverance. And people would invite us from far and near because they were guaranteed to have a shout. We sung with excellence. And I was still learning. I was still learning. I was still a novice. But whatever the congregations of people were hearing, they were hearing the, the power of God. And um, we traveled a lot as a choir. Uh, moving on, I finally moved to New Jersey. Um, how I got to New Jersey was I was introduced. So this is so ironic and a blessing. I was introduced um, to the musician, the minister of music at that time at the palace, the Rev. Nike's church, because he was still alive. The church was still going on in the 70s. And um, she also was a musician at Institutional Church of God in Christ with Bishop Williams. Um, and I can't call her name right now because mm. it's so long ago. But the church that I wanted to audition for was in Orange, New Jersey. Now, I was living in the Bronx, but somebody had recommended to me to Dr. Jiggets. You ever heard of Robert Jiggets? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Jiggins, he's an organist, keep, piano player. Yeah. He was on piano, but he was with uh, Lawrence Roberts and them back in the day uh, with Jeff Banks. They all were friends. And is this so, I won't even say ironic. It was this full circle how God led me around these preachers, these pastors. Um, somebody um, recommended me to Bishop Jiggins, uh, Liberty Temple Universal Church of Christ in Orange, New Jersey. And I went there and I played, but he really wanted me to audition. So, I, or because he was um, from out of the palace for Re under Reverend Ike. So I went to the palace and I went to that pit because you know that they have the pit that goes up and down and the organ was there, that C3. And I auditioned and I guess she was satisfied and I got the job um, in New Jersey, but I was still living in the Bronx. Uh, as God would have it, uh, I became a member. I moved to New Jersey and I became a member of a Liberty Temple. And I was there for 10 years as organist, uh, eventually became the minister of music. And um, I found out that Dr. Jigas was friends with Lawrence Roberts back in the day. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so word kind of got out that um, of our choir, because you ever heard of Al Dr. Albert Lewis? Lewis. Dr. Albert Jay Lewis from uh, he he's he's known in this area. Um, he has his own TV station and he always um, puts if, if there's new talent, he's going to push new talent. So our okay. choir came from the Bronx and he was you know he loved what we did. And then when he found out that I lived here, um, he used to push me a lot. Okay. And um, he was friends with the director from. Um, Revival Temple, Bishop Jeff Banks in Revival Temple. Uh, the director then was Avery White. And Avery gave him my number and he called me and, you know, no, he, Avery got my number from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lewis, Dr. Lewis. And Avery asked me, would I be able to come and play on a project? I never played on no project before. A project, what's that? <laughs> um, I dreamed of one day, I could play on, on a session or something like that. Um, but he um, came to Liberty Temple and that was an 80 something. Now I can't remember what date it was, maybe 86, seven, eight, something like that. And I played on, I think it was the Stormers, the Stormers Over album, I believe that was. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I played, but one song, I only played one song because they had to test me. And how they auditioned me, I had never been to Revival Temple before. I went to Revival Temple. I lived in Newark, on the Weequay section of Newark, and I went to the inner city of Newark on 16th Avenue in Littleton. And how I was auditioned by Milton Bingham, I had to audition uh, by playing for Doc McKenzie and Highway QC. Do you remember them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going way back. Uh, 
he saw, he told me to get on the organ. I want you to just play with them. So, you know, quartet's playing E, A, C. <laughs> so, thank God, the song that they did was in C. And um, I forgot the name of the song. And they were impressed. Reverend Bingham was impressed. So I got the call that I would play on this one song. And the song was um, Pray in the Spirit. I believe the name of the song was. It was written by one of the musicians of Revival Temple, Dennis Bynes. And he came to my house and he said, help me put this song together. And, you know, he sung it to me and he played it. I said, we should do this, you should do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we did the song. Of course, you know, James Perry was a, one of the producers. Um, so, you know, he added his flavor to it. And that my name wasn't on that on that song. I should have been on that song. <laughs> you mentioned James. Now, where is James? James is still around. Oh, yes. yes. James Perry is still alive and kicking. That's yeah, the Lord. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right now, he's a revival temple right now. Help um, okay, assisting okay. with the music. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was my first album. And then there was a couple of more, but the main two that I, pl I played the whole two albums, the whole, the whole session was the um, uh, He's All Over Me, written by um, um, mm, mm, mm. He's All Over Me and Keeping Me Alive. Alvin Darling. Alvin Darling. You know Alvin Darling? In the Alvin Darling uh, ensemble? Ever darling, yeah, I've heard, I have, I don't know him personally. Yeah, but he's out there. He's he's out there with his material. He has, he's more he's fl contemporary slash quartet style. Okay, like, yeah. like right in the middle. Um, that was his song. He's all over me, and um, I was just there to teach a song. Uh, the name of the song was um, "He Alone." I taught this song to my church choir. God gave me the song. It's more of a, a praise and worship kind of song. Back then, it was no praise and worship. So, you know, now I say that would have been a great praise and worship kind of song. Yeah. But um, so I was taught my song. And for some reason, um, what happened? Oh, Joe Wilson went on tour because he was the organist for that session. It was Jeff Davis, Joe Wilson, James Perry. Um, uh, Dwayne Johnson and some other musicians from our area. And I was just there. I was just loving being there. You know, mm. and this was a new experience for me. I teach my song. I would sit down and just stay to listen. So while I was there, all these songs were embedded in my mind. And for some reason, Joe went on tour. Oh, he went on tour with Guy. You remember the R&B group Guy? Yeah, oh yeah. Teddy Raleigh? He went on tour. And um, I think Jeff went on tour as well. So it ended up being me on the organ. Milton Bingham approached me and said, well, you've been here for all these rehearsals and the other organist, uh, he couldn't make it, um, Dennis Bynes. So he said, can you, do you think you could handle the session? I said, I'll try. I've never done it before, it's a new experience. So because uh, Joe went on tour and Dennis couldn't be a part of the session, um, we rehearsed for two, weeks for hours yeah upon hours and upon hours <laughs> <laughs> my kids were little and they would have to come with me and lay on the um the pews of um james's church uh, milton and james church um mount vernon baptist church yeah and so that's why i know my kids are gifted because they've been around it their whole lives and they couldn't help it um but for two weeks Mm. But I will say that was a great experience. And that was my open door. That was my aha uh, yeah. of how to uh, govern yourselves for a session, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm an organist. My husband, you know, he was um, bass player extraordinaire and he'd been playing with them for years with James and they went to school together, you know, yeah. so all those musicians, they grew up together playing in bands and all that. And he used to tell me, he said, you come from New York and you used to your foot in your left hand, but you got you got you got to put a chain on those. <laughs> you you got to put a chain on your hand and your foot. And oh. <laughs> he told me, he said, "Cause you got to play the pad." I said, "What is the pad?" You know, I learned what the pad was. 
recording every now and then you do a little something you keep that yeah. but the organ holds that the drums the bass and the organ holds that that thing i'm saying good night to my grandbaby <laughs> <laughs> i've been i've been uh uh babysitting all, all week all right. my daughter so my sister's here watching the baby for me while i do the zoom um but basically that was my start of laying tracks of tracking yeah. and um james perry played a great part in showing me how to uh use the different apps and the different computers and mac and windows back in that day they were using windows um, yeah. You know, I didn't know anything about that, but he he played a great part in the technic, technical part of um, music. Um, from there, um, you know, my mother-in-law, her name is Mary Andrews. I asked that everybody would say a prayer for Mother Mary Andrews because she was like the matriarch of the Andrews. Um, my last name, my maiden name is Ware, Linnell. Rashonde mm -hmm. Ware, but my married name is Andrews, and I married married into a musical family. My husband was a genius; he left here too soon, and mm -hmm. under tragic uh, circumstances. But I learned a lot from him. And one thing he always said to me: "I want you to get around James Perry and Carlton Pope. You know Carlton Pope, right?" Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got to get around them. You got to get around Alex Mack. He was just name all these musicians because he knew I was, you know, new from New York. And um, what I would do was pay attention to these different musicians and how they uh, handled themselves in sessions. Even when I was in a part of session, just to be there and watch them, I learned a lot. And um, I told God, this is what I want to do. But I also told God that I wanna be a blessing that when I play, I don't, just don't want it to be for show. I want somebody's life to be touched. I want someone to feel the, his power and his spirit when I play whatever keyboard organ, usually on the organ, that it's not just for the fame and fortune. Yes, I like, yes, we like the limelight sometimes. Of course we do. Mm. But for me, it's more than just um, being on stage or being uh, in a big church or playing for a big choir. I could be in the smallest church, small as my house, the size of my home and, and have church. And it doesn't even me mean anything to me because it's about whose life is being set free and delivered because I've been through some things in my life, um, drug addiction while I'm in the church and the deliverance sanctified church mm -hmm. went through that. And um, it was through family members and friends to help me get through that. And I always told God yeah, that I, yeah. I would never want to um, prostitute his gift, which happens mm -hmm. now and has been happening for years because yeah. of money and fame. You know, if I never become a name as long as somebody's life is being touched and, and, and uh, I, I found out that your, your gift will make room for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you do what he asks you to do, he will make room for you. And I also learned, cause I've seen some of my colleagues over the years that when you think too high of yourself, God will cut you down. Right. And, yes, he will. And uh, he, should have and could have shut me down, but he knew I had a, a, a substance problem and he helped me through that. Mm -hmm. So I always, I always tell my um, testimony to be delivered from crack cocaine and being a minister evangelist yeah. and was smoking, you know? And that happened because I was medicating the pain the first my mother passing many years ago when I was in high school and then my husband being killed tragically left for two children. So I guess I was medi. I found out, you know, mm. I went to the program, you know, I went to the outpatient program. Thank God for Bishop Banks and Bishop Greer from down cathedral of faith in Atlanta. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those bishops helped me. You, Get, you, you know, all of the guys. Mm -hmm, Cause from they all came to the day. day. Yeah. I yes, played with several yes. of them, Bishop, Bishop, ba well, Bishop Banks was my pastor. Bishop Greer was dear friends with Bishop Banks. So he was always, and he became our overseer when Bishop Banks passed away. Yeah. And now um, Bishop Woods became the, pa the bishop, the pastor. It was at 99. So yeah. Bishop Banks died in 97. 
but um, you know, I've God has blessed me to be and play for different people like uh, Todd Hall and mm. Noel Jones. Noel Jones was trying to get me to move to Texas when he was down there. But yeah. uh, my kid, children were young and I knew my, my husband had just died. My mother-in-law wasn't having it, but yeah. you know, you think about some of the decisions you make, but I've had the pleasure of playing for many. That's a blessing. And I've been on several stages uh, um, many times. Symphony Hall, Newark, uh, Master Square Garden, uh, here in Jersey, um, New Jersey Pack Performing Arts, um, Carnegie Hall a few years ago. Yeah. Um, been to Russia, Italy, uh, the Bahamas, Dominican Republic. I would have done more traveling, but because I had children. Yeah. I could do that when they got old enough that I could leave them as teenagers and I did that. Um, mm. But then because of my addiction, um, I settled down. I said, I don't want to do the touring thing. Mm. And God opened the door um, where I became the volunteer in 1998 at of the East Orange School District. And how that happened was because um, one of the former choir members of the Temple Bells, it's the youth choir at Liberty Temple, uh, the young man was graduating. His name was Shante Anthony. I saw him on the bus one day. Uh, and he said, Aunt Nell, why don't you come and, and help our gospel choir? We got this, these nice voices in our choir. We, we need, a God, we need a, somebody can play gospel. Mrs. Sikowski, that was the, the band teacher at the time at East Orange High School. He was the band teacher, but he didn't know anything about choir. Mm -hmm. So as God would have it, during my, um, I had just um past my time of being in the outpatient for the drug program um this young man asked me to come to east orange high school so things were ha things happened i went to the school i auditioned the principal like me and um long story short uh the choir was everything they could sing i was playing directing them and it was a wonderful thing. What ended up happening was they hired me the next ne the next year to be not a volunteer, but uh, to be uh, part time. So I would go into the school and I would assist Mr. Sikoski, who was a Jewish man, but he was saved and had the Holy Ghost. Isn't that something? Mm, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sikoski had a Jewish name, but he I don't know. I forgot the story he told me of when he received Christ, but he had the Holy Spirit. And um, he pushed the gospel choir. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> a young man from, a uh, young teacher from South Carolina, Mr. Williams, Frederick Williams, he joined the staff as an English teacher. And then when he found out that we had a choir, they, we started working together. And our choir ended up touring mm. uh, up, up down the East Coast. We went to Maryland. We took them to... Um, What's the name of the college in, in Maryland? Um, Morgan State. And they sung for you know Morgan State Choir and they we went to different churches and sang. We went to competitions. I'll never forget, we went to a competition and we went to this middle school in Virginia. Never forget. This middle school looked like a college. The campus looked like a college. Oh. <laughs> it was amazing. And we were in awe, you know, all these, you know, inner city urban kids, they were in amazement. And here I had a lot of these children, teenagers that were up and coming singers and musicians. You know, I was teaching them how to play and what they would be in my class and show them how to read. They didn't want to read. All they want to do was come and play. Uh, one young man, all he wanted to play was um, Fred Hammond's song, Blessing the Season. Oh, hey, uh, Miss mm -hmm. Andrews, can you play this? And so I would play it and say, oh, word, you can play that. You know, I got, okay. got those, you know, so they would end up coming to my church, to Revival Temple, to learn, those same children. And they would play with me when we did these tours, you know. You know, I would do the majority of the playing, but, you know, I'll show them how to play the bass, you know, how to play certain things on the bass, how to play certain lines on the drums, you know. Don't do too much. They always say I would yell at them because I was banging them and stop that play this mm -hmm. and now to this day they're in their 30s and stuff now doing play for artists and traveling they thank me for those days wow. from back in the day yeah but we we won that competition 
out of all, all those other schools that came up singing classical music and singing pop music and, and show tunes. We sung our little set of gospel and we won with a 97 score. And that was amazing to us. And it was amazing even to um, the, the different contestants that we won. We were this inner city, quote unquote, I wanna say it, but I'm gonna say it, from the hood. Yeah. <laughs> but all these gifted brown skinned children, you know, um, mm. yellow, brown, cause you know, we had some, even called, we had some Caucasians in our school, um, um, Latino, Haitian, African, American children it was sounding like a professional choir. It was, a, they were an amazement. Um, after that, um, I became full-time in 2005, 2006. And so I've been there ever since. I've been there since 1998 up until now. And um, I do want to retire. I think I can retire mm -hmm. next. Either 2023 or 2024, I can retire because I started late, you know, as yeah. far as career. Um, wow. uh, so I left Revival Temple in 2016. There's a lot in between, um, yeah. uh, but I'm trying to keep it moving. Uh, in 2016, let me just say I left on good terms because I, I, I can always go back home. Yes, I know that's right. I can always go back home to, to my family. Um, but God had another avenue and direction for me. Yeah. And I um, had the opportunity to play for St. Paul Baptist Church of Montclair, New Jersey. Um, uh, at that time, I don't think they had the pastor at the time. The pastor was just being uh, installed. Pastor Bernadette Glover, renowned pastor of this area. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful woman of God. Um, and that was a blessing for me because it's like I, I was picking up the broken pieces. You know, Paul talks about mm -hmm. holding on to the broken pieces. When it, you know, when you're drowning, you hold on to the broken pieces. I was picking up the broken pieces of this music department and God has blessed us. Um, it's not the same choir. I would say not the same music department or the same music ministry. Okay. Um, since I've been there, God gets all the glory. It's not me but it's the God in me that's showing me how to lead and be a director and director of music, minister of music. And it's been a joy. And under the leadership of a great woman of God, mm -hmm. Pastor Dr. Bernadette Glover. Look her up, y'all. She's great. 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 You got some folk in the comment section. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Barbara, Barbara Ann Baskerville. Yes. And Dr. Weeda Harding. That's my friend. That's my now, friend. let me just say, I'm glad she came because I jumped a lot. Dr. Weeda is the one, is one of the ones uh -huh. that I wanted to pattern my life after as mm -hmm. far as musicianship because um, our church was a part of the United Missionary Baptist Association, which they had this um, Bible school that happened every year. And I used to go to the Bible school um, for summer. And she was my um, my counselor, music counselor. Isn't that something? <laughs> that something? Yeah. And we yeah. became big, great friends after that. You know, she was my. I always said I want to. What she was doing, I said I got to. I have to do that. You gotta learn how to do that. I gotta learn how to do that. I was only fourteen years old. I said, do how it. does she do that? You know, she's leading and singing and, and directing and giving parts and playing. I said, how do, doing it all? How do these people do that? You know, it was yeah. just so foreign. That you know, to me at that time. But Dr. Weeder was the one that kind of really influenced me uh, by watching her. Um, uh, of course, yeah. Twinkie Clark and the Clark Sisters, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, some of the young people, some of our youth, youth might not have heard of um, uh, Benny Cummings in King's Temple. Oh, yes. Okay. I, we used to be, our, our choir used to be on oh. programs with them back in the day. Benny Cummings used to come here. Oh. For the Lucille Lemon singers with the Varsas. Okay. okay, okay. And yes. um, I was going to ask you, did you, did you, uh, in your time, did you meet? Um, was the New York Community Choir? They recorded 
Yes. With Isaac Douglas. Oh, yes. And then uh, mm -hmm. one of the guys from here, Daryl Hardy. Yeah, yeah, Daryl Hardy. They did that arrangement of Peace Be Still and a mm -hmm. whole lot of other stuff. Then, of course, uh, Bishop Freddie Washington. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, great friend of mine. Yes. Yeah, and of course, Butch Haywood over my, at Institution. My brother, my, my brother. <laughs> J.C. White and yes. uh, all that old crew. Mm hmm we used to, uh, a lot of people didn't know, a lot of the stuff we did here in Detroit, you know, cause uh, when I was at St. James, Reverend loved some institutional. Mm. We were saying a lot, cause we had to slow them down to the back of the But I'm telling you, uh -huh. a lot of that, a lot of that good old music uh, from back in the day, just good choir stuff. Quiet. You yes. Know, uh, we would we would we would grab those songs and try to put our spin on it. You got Absolutely. you got um, David Sturdivant said, "Bless you, Linnell Andrews, for your awesome transparency and testimony Thank in you. blessing others that they can overcome whatever strongholds that are in their life." And he said he's enjoying this. Thank you, brother David. God, God bless you, brother Chime David. In. God bless you. Yeah, yeah. Lord brought me from a mighty long way. I didn't, I never thought that I would be where I am now because I was despondent and I thought my life was over. And yeah. when I, I just want to say that God does talk. He speaks. He speaks through people. He speaks through the scriptures. He speaks through the music. Yeah. But when necessary, He will speak audibly. And when I told God, I. I I just want to tell this one testimony that I hope this blesses yeah. somebody. Um, I had finished using and my kids were at my mother-in-law's house who was there for me through, through the thick and thin. And also my, my uh, she's not my blood sister, but she's like a sister. And I call her sister. Uh, Stephanie Bland was one of the ones that helped me when I was going through. Minister yeah. Stephanie Bland, she's on Facebook. Um, I was in the bathroom of my home in Orange, New Jersey. And I said, God, I can't do this no more. I looked in the mirror. I said, I'm tired of living. After I said, I'm tired of living, there was this sound in my ear. I felt this rustling. And I heard this voice say, Linnell, I am gonna do a new thing in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm in the bathroom by myself. So I'm looking around like, so God, you took, I said, God, you talking to me? <laughs> I was like, I started laughing like, God, are you talking to me? And he said it again. It wasn't like our voices, but mm. it was a voice. So Linnell, I'm going to do a new thing in your life. And he it went away. And immediately I felt the power of God just overtake me. And my deliverance didn't come right then. I had to go through a little bit more. It came like about a year and a half later. I went mm. through some trials and tribulations. But about a year and a half later, I finally got my total deliverance. Um, and that came through, part of it came through, God placed counselors in those programs that were pastors and had the Holy Ghost. So they were able to minister to me and testify as well as I was going through the program. So I'm just saying that, God, if you, there's anything going on in your lives that is you're addicted to, doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol. It could be yeah. people, places, things. Give it to God and tell him about it. He will help you because he did it for me. And I was in a very low state in my life. I was down mm. at the bottom. I had to look up to get up. And God brought wow. me up through the love of other people. I just wanted That's to say amazing. that. It's amazing. Yeah. It really is. He did a miracle in my life. Yeah. So I always say if he could do it for me, he could do it for anybody. Yeah, we had purpose for your life. Thank you, Michelle Pryor. Always faithful. Mm -hmm. uh, sharing in the comment section. Well, well, uh, well, going through that and and still holding on to your your music ambitions and and still somehow fighting through, and then finally deliverance came mm -hmm. uh, when you surrendered. You said yes. you were tired, and God said, "Okay, mm -hmm. you tired? I'm tired for you." Yep. And brought you through that, and 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 since then the journey. I mean, your music. How has it changed your outlook, and and your your approach 
toward worship as a musician? I always look for the, a sound. Yeah. You know, always look for that sound. Um, the sound could just be normal triads. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. But if that triad, along with other progressions, is gonna, gonna lead the people into God's presence, that's what I look for. Mm -hmm. That's what I look for. I look for, even like, because you know, I've had the opportunity to play with R&B bands, you know, here and there, um, doing wedding, whatever, whatever it is, that's not quote unquote church. I look for whatever sound I'm playing. If I'm playing, I want the people to feel it. Yeah. And I think all musicians want that. But I believe, quote unquote, saved musicians should always want their music, not just to impress. Like, oh, doc, oh, sister, you did that. If I didn't know you were a lady, I would have sworn you was a man. I don't, I don't need to hear all that. All I need to know is that somebody's <laughs> life was touched. Because I get that. I used to get that a lot when I first was starting out. I thought that was a guy playing. Why can't I be a sister just playing, trying to play right? Correct. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But that's my approach is to magnify God through my music. If I'm writing it or if I'm helping somebody write or if I'm composing right now, I've been working with um, the house genre. And even with that, I want God to be heard in that genre. Yeah. Because the chords that I'm playing, it's what I've been playing in church. I'm just rearranging it in a different way, you know, mm -hmm. and doing, you know, to, to, um, um, apply to that genre, but those church chords are in there. You might, and I tell people all the time that most of the, the music that you hear out there on the pop tip, R and B, mm -hmm. um, hip hop, neo soul, those are church musicians. Yeah. Those are church. That's been going on forever. Church musicians set the tone for the music industry. Hands down. You got it. You Hands got down. It. Because the band, I guarantee you, somebody up in there is a church musician. They go home off that tour, off that gig, they go home back to their church to play. Yeah, yeah. I have many friends over yeah. the years, even now, even some of my, my, my younger friends, that's what they do, even at, at my church. Um, beautiful, saved young men. Brother Cliff Key plays the bass, and um, they call him Biscuit, but Brother James Rouse, Holy Ghost film. He, he's, he used to play at um, uh, Bruce Parham's church in Philly. He's from Philly. Oh, okay. Wow. But he, you know, they're, they play for um, R&B bands, and they play for wedding bands and stuff like that. Yeah. But they love God. They love the Lord. And I learned, the Lord spoke to me years ago, that music is music, is what humans do to the music that takes the music and destroys it yeah you know but it's nothing wrong with living listening to a love song it's nothing wrong with listening to jazz it's nothing wrong with listening to r and B. I i love it i listen to every day <laughs> every single day because i get so many ideas from listening to the different genres yeah we got a station here that they play uh Part of the day they play classical, late at night they play the jazz. Mm -hmm. But it's but it's it's all original and, mm -hmm. and so much classic music mm -hmm. that um, the the regular stations don't even pick up to play. Right. And, well, that's good. That instrumental, uh, the instrumentalists. I mean, it's just just an awesome, awesome station, uh, and and we love it here in Detroit. Uh, Barbara says again, um, through it all, praise God, he brought you out. Yes, Sister Bar Baskerville, you notice she knows, she knows the story. Yeah, she said, I always admire your strength mm -hmm. in him. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Let thank me you, ask you this. Let me ask you this about uh, since you, you got a chance to get that Pentecostal experience, mm -hmm. feeling of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, and nowadays, it seems like the uh, musicians with the uh, the tracks and the, the bass, the full band effect, uh, most of them are patterned. I guess as a musician, I try to be open and, mm -hmm. and but what gets me is when I grew up, we had to play under the anointing. My grandfather was like, let the Holy Spirit play through you. 
Right. Because I need you to follow the wave of the service and what I'm going to, what the Lord will lead me to do. I need you right there with me musically. Right. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand none of that. Right. But being brought up in it and trained, you know, there's nothing like a musician and a preacher working together. I mean, in a service. Oh my God. It's, <laughs> it's an awesome combination spiritually. Yes, it is. But um, uh, some of these musicians, they, they, uh, that's that little thin line there between the anointing and a performance. Right. Where, where they get caught up in the licks and the runs and, and then they forget, you know, you still in a worship experience Absolutely. and uh, people uh, still need to be healed, delivered. In some cases need to be just saved. And uh, we can't, we can't leave you know, that place where we are, once we get there and lock in, we got to stay locked in. You have to. And, and and some of them that don't understand that, you know, that's why I say, I guess we got to do more teaching and, yes. and sharing the experience so that they will understand this is not, this is not a gig. This is ministry. It's not a gig. This is a ministry. It is and, not a gig. and sometime when I'm playing with, with a crew, uh i'm like okay y'all kind of holding back my own spot creativity i like the you know Spread i like the wings. So, <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> and i and then i had to remember like you said i had to remember i got a bass player because i love running them foot pedals in that left hand i'm trying to tell you i love it i'm like we got all this organ i'm gonna play all of it all of it <laughs> y'all catch me if you can because uh, uh there's a couple of licks y'all missed on that guitar i got to go back <laughs> this next round and fill it in so when y'all hear it next time you get it, i used to have a bass player to play with me he used to laugh at me and thank god he was a keyboard player too okay and he he said you know what i'm gonna start doing for you I'm just going to stand right behind you, look over your shoulder, because you're not going to stop playing that left hand. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Pray for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's a joy. Yes. There's nothing like when, when, when the music, the singing, the, the vocals, and mainly the musicians lock in on one accord. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're talking about moving that worship shifting things and shifting and, uh, the atmosphere what an experience I, I i grew up in that in those instances where the lord will come in so in a worship until even after benediction mm -hmm. musicians are still at it just you know still at it going on That's right. folk going home getting they getting their raps yes. on their way out the door to the parking lot and 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 the, and the Holy Spirit have that music pumping out. I mean, people are still rejoicing and being delivered. Oh, those are some wonderful, sweet experiences. Wonderful, wonderful. That that can't be manufactured. I don't care nobody say. That's not this can't be. No, it, it's not man made at all. Mm -mm. It's, it's totally uh, yielding to the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you this about. Since we're talking about worship, what's your take on we praying that we get the choir back real soon, the full choir, mm -hmm. uh, we can get through this thing within the next year or so? Because uh, I miss it, I'm telling you. Me too. Praise team is all right, but I <laughs> I grew up on choir. And, mm -hmm. and to me, they're, they're, they do okay. Everybody got a mic. and But there there's some songs that just don't have the same effect because it's just a choir song. My sister was telling me the other day, I, I was going to teach the choir this song. No, she said, who's doing this? The praise team of the choir. It was for the men. She said, this should be the, for, the, for the choir. I said, they're going to be okay. But I, I got what she was saying. Yeah. Because that sound, you know, it's a totally different flow yeah. from praise team to choir. Yeah, yeah, and 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 some people get it, some people don't. But 
Mm -hmm. I'll be like, Lord, smile upon us, please, real soon. I believe he's going to do it, but is this not going to be the same? No, no. It'll no, never no. be the same. It'll never but, be the uh, same. I'm telling you. Uh -huh. These little, these little praise. Some I know here in Detroit, I went to a service one time. They was talking about me, so they said, your facial expressions, you ain't got to say nothing. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> it was one of them cases, Elder, that I couldn't hear them for looking at them. Mm. And Lord, then, then when you get these praise leaders getting up fussing at you and stuff, I'm like, mm. I don't feel like touching nobody today and giving high five and standing up for 20 minutes while we watch you jump around. You know, if y'all gone insane, we might get with you. But they got to talk and walk and tell everybody what to do, what not. I'm like, oh. Do you have people in, in the congregation saying, sing? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Just sing? <laughs> Please go ahead on. Please sing. And you're supposed to be a praise leader. Would you go on and lead us in the praise? Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It yeah. is really something. It's really something. Absolutely. Now, now tell us what, what, if anything, you have on your agenda, musically, you're writing anything, you got something going, a project that you're currently working on. Well, COVID kind of slowed me down a little bit. Um, the most creating I've been doing is like rearranging. Um, what I do, like I'll take a song, so do you know that all choirs can't sing what comes out over the radio, right? Oh, God, you yeah, know. <laughs> so what I do, I rearrange a lot, you know, to fit um, my choir at the church that I'm at now. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as, and, and I'll write, I will write a song to fit yeah. um, uh, a group of people or a choir or a praise team. And I, I did that since I've been at, at um, St. Paul. I wrote a song called um, Oh Come Let Us Adore Him. It has mm -hmm. kind of like a, like a, a Timothy Wright kind of flavor. The people liked it. They said, who sings this song? I said, nobody. Somebody mm -hmm. needs to be singing. So I said, I'm trying to put some stuff together that I've written um, yeah. just for the choir. They liked it or whoever liked it. And then I get the... the, the uh, the praise report that that was a that blessed my life da, 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 da. so i i have to put these songs together at least um uh ep of some kind because um i i, I won't say i had a group my group was called evangelist Linnell andrews in one voice we did one mm -hmm. project in uh the early 2000s beautiful songs were on there but as you as you know it costs it costs to record and you know to put out so yeah. i didn't go that route again but what i did do we did a single right when COVID was just coming into fruition or that that we knew about it um in january of 2020 um we did a house version of oh give thanks mm -hmm. but under the name of Linnell andrews and determined we are formerly one voice but um different singers if I may have one or two that are charter members up there from the beginning, mm -hmm. but um, the name of the group is Determined. And um, just recently, we were asked to sing at the African American Heritage Festival in, in Montclair. And I just recently got a, another engagement to do in Newark um, in September. I think, I guess it's for Labor Day or something, but it's going to be an outdoor event. Um, so I haven't really been doing much that way because of COVID because you have to have a place to rehearse. They used to come here and rehearse. Sometimes we'd be at my church, be here, but I can't have people coming here. You don't know who's infected or, you know, yeah, when we're in a larger areas. room, you know, we're spread out, mask are on. If we don't have mask on, we're spread out. So that kind of slowed me down as far as really keeping yeah. busy with the group. But we do still get in engagements. When I get an engagement, I say, okay, we're gonna do it. You know, I pull them together. The last uh, game that we did that was in New York was for uh, I can't call her last name. One of the members of um, Citadel, um, 
Deborah Pritchard. She's one of the members of James Hall Worship and Praise. Oh, okay. Deborah Pritchard, she has the lower voice, singing voice. Okay, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, she had a program and that was one of our first engagements as determined uh, at Citadel in Brooklyn. And then that was in 2019 and that following year, um, a lot of, uh, well, that's for all of us. So many engagements and opportunities I had for 2020 was crushed. And I know I'm not the only one. Um, right, yeah, all, of, only all of us. Trust yes, me. so um, we in the process of trying to regroup. I'm just trying to see how all this is going on as far as diseases. We've got this monkey pox going on in New York right now. Did you hear about that? Yeah, what is Monkey pox. <laughs> it's like a smallpox kind of thing. It's, it's like running rampant in New York. It remind oh. me uh, of that picture years ago, uh, outbreak, and it yes. was monkey. Mm -hmm. That caused the outbreak. That caused it. Yes, 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 yes. I'm like, come on, y'all, y'all. Here mm -hmm. we go again with something Here we go. else. Something else. And the different variants of COVID, you know, the numbers go down. Then I hear my sister tells me that we back up to 16,000 or 12,000, you know, 1,200, whatever it is across the state. Um, Same thing here in Michigan. So it's hard to really regroup with a group setting you know because i have to be in i can rent a studio you know dr glover i'm sure she will let me use a church but i don't want to put people in danger you know being a small group yeah so that's my only setback right now is this disease these diseases because i don't want anybody to get sick right because right. i have been having rehearsal here i have organ you know, i can get a drum set everything is here you know hmm. but my tracks everything you know, my, everything is here but um, I just don't want to uh, put my family at risk. Like I'm watching my grandbaby this week. I can't put her at risk. She's only one years old. Right, right. You know, but that, that's, that's what we're up against right now is these diseases that are mm -hmm. causing us to not really come back fully as a congregation or as a choir. Right. You know, but what we did, St. Paul, I use this as an example. Um. We started as services didn't start, but we did, everybody was doing a Zoom. Everybody was doing a Zoom. So I'm looking at two screens. I got the screen here and screen there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we were doing um, uh, just a watered down version of a praise team. You know, certain members of the, I chose certain members of the choir. And that was our praise team because we really never had a praise team when I joined there. Yeah. Uh, but we started the praise team. And we sang in mass. So what I had the choir do, I went online. What I had the praise team do, I went online and found this product it was called a singer's mask. Mm -hmm. And that we started, they ordered the singer's mask and that's what we're doing, we sing in mass. We still sing in mass to this day at my church. Um, <clears throat> and we would pre-record and then it would air on Sundays. We started doing it in September of 2020. Then when wow. 2020, when one rolled around, I would say in, it was either August or September, um, uh, Dr. Glover and the administration decided to open up the church to only, we only could have like 50 uh, in the church at that time by orders of the state. And right. then eventually, you know, it started opening up, you know, and I, I'm sure that you all know you have to sign in, you know, temperature check and all that, all, um, of, that. Yeah, all of that. So <laughs> we used to be a, a 40 voice choir right now. We like, I would say from between 16 to 20 on both sides, you know, I have to do it that way, it's spaced. Um, of course, the sound is very, very key. Sound is, yeah. I'm shaking my head. <laughs> sound is key, ladies and gentlemen, key, because you want to be able to hear the voices. You don't want to hear just one voice. You want to hear everybody. So, you know, we went through that uh, troubleshooting of having the, the mics placed in the right spot and, you know, to get that sound. Um, so, you know, the sound ministry is hand in hand with the music ministry. Right. Very important. They're not two separate ent entities. Got to have good sound and music, we work together. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. And um, I thank God our sound um, department, music, our uh, audio video um, 
there were some changes. You know, we lost a sound engineer. He went into another career or what to play, to do something else. So, you know, um, the deacons stepped up and they're doing what they do, but they have that, uh, that knowledge, technical mm. knowledge. And I, I also brought somebody in, uh, a friend of mine, uh, to help out with the sound. So we're getting there. The sound is so important for what we're doing now. We are alive. I, I tell the choir, we are alive. There's no time for mistakes. You got to study the music. You know, we have rehearsal on Tuesdays. You have a whole week to study the music. And um, that's what I push. You know, we have to study so that we can show ourselves approved because we are live. It's not just we playing it by ear. Oh, we made a mistake. Oh, I made a mistake. Director made it. Can't do that no more. We have to really pray and ask God to give us guidance when we get into his presence on a Sunday morning or wherever we are. Because, you know, right. Zooms and lives and uh, with the, uh, stream yards, that's, that's our life now. Yes, it's get with the program and get it. Yeah, so whatever uh, we can do with the technology, technology is ministry as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Teresa Acton. She done got home from the workshop. Oh, Dr. Good. Harding want to know uh, what are some of the things you're planning to do after you retire from school? I plan to, um, well, if we see what COVID says, I would like to go on tour. I like to do some things that I haven't done because I'm very, I'm a very committed person. I don't church hop, you know, I'll be, at, when I'm at a church, I'm there. Um, I guess you can call me true blue. I'm true blue. And I um, always said there's certain things I wanted to do that my friends were doing. I couldn't do it because, you know, I hold a position of minister music and um, I can't go and come as I please. I didn't want to do that. So I would like to do some traveling, some touring, um, hmm. you know, even um, uh, speaking like I'm doing now. This could bless somebody's life. Yeah. You know, I got my degree late in life. <laughs> uh, I got my bachelor's in music production in 2018 in my old age, but I learned so much from Full Sail University. So, yeah. I, you know, I would like to, you know, I don't want to stop teaching, but if I can go around and help build and encourage our youth, that's what I would like to do. Well, that's really my ministry. Yeah. I've been pouring into youth my whole life. Because the, and the evidence is when I get the phone calls, or when I want to get the aunt nails. Uh, thank you for yelling at me. Thank you for throwing the book at me. Thank you for slamming on the organ. Thank you, you know, for 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 your guidance. Because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. So I know that even though I'm at the age that I am, that I know how a lot of young people think. Mm -hmm. I even try my best to glean from them. Even though they're gleaning from me, I glean from them so that I can stay relevant for this time that we live in. Um, so yes, I would like, we to, I definitely want to pour into young people. I would like to tour some, but I would like to have some kind of uh, avenue way to pour into our up and coming um, youth who are becoming um, musicians and singers, up and coming directors of music, up and coming band leaders and music directors, praise and worship leaders. I would like to do that. Oh wow, that, that's well. It's all it's here, and it's not going nowhere. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta learn it. A uh, couple more. Teresa wants to know. Yeah. Um, I think we might have talked about it a little bit as your choir suffered a decrease in attendance. Yes. Yeah. Choir suffered a decrease in attendance because some are really skeptical and apprehensive about coming back. Yeah. Um, because you don't know who has what, you know, and I understand that. We took a little hit. Um, some people did move, well, before COVID, some people moved away, you know, different careers and, you know, some moved away, some key voices that I didn't want to leave. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but we still, still, choir is still great, you know. Um, like I said, we have 40 people in the choir, but 35 to 40. But now we're down to like 16 to 20. But some of that is because um, people are apprehensive of coming back because they don't want to get sick. And, and 
they're in fear of, of their lives. You know, I mean, a lot of people still feel like that. I'm not really in fear of my life, but I'm, I want to be wise, you know, right, right. how I approach this, how we approach this thing called COVID yes. and, and everything else that's happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rather be safe than sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know that's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But listen, in, in, in the time that we have left, I want you to take your, take your time and share from your heart some um, counsel to this next generation. Uh, Because I know here, there are some that in the next generation uh, are open to listen and to take counsel, you know, now with all this stuff, they got, they got the bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they feel like they don't need us, Mm -hmm. who they call old school. I said, drop the old off and just come on and go to school. Go to school. Because y'all, you got, you you need, you know, because. You need a foundation. Yeah, I, I'm still telling them, you know, roots. If, if I'm so old school and not relevant, then why at certain times we all at the same place? Somebody get up, start singing something, and y'all be totally lost. And guess who they got to call? The old school guys and, and ladies, and you know. So uh, just give us some counsel from your experience that I'm sure the this generation could use. Sure, I would love to. Um, There's a saying, a theme that uh, Dr. Glover came up with a few years ago called uh, deep roots, new branches. And the only way that we can uh, build and grow and keep the legacy of gospel music, we have to glean from the roots. I gleaned from the roots. At one time, I was a teenager, like I gave some of my uh, testimony that I was listening to everybody and everything because I wanted to learn. And I was very humble. Humble is the way. I used to teach my young people at the church, even now. My, my nephew even says it to me now. said, Mel, thank you for telling me that. Sherrod, a great drummer. Sherrod Williams. Humble is the way. And I used to say, what would, you, how would, you, what would Jesus do? You know, the way we handle people. I've learned that sometimes young folks don't know how to uh, um, talk to adults. Mm. Even though you're the leader and they should listen to you because you're the lead, but there's a way that you talk to people. And I had to learn how to, you have to learn how to talk to people um, as you're coming up into these positions, you know, to whom, whom much is given, much is required. And one of the requirements is respect and love. And that's why I, I try to depict and I try to show to whoever I'm leading or directing or teaching, I should be able to be instructable. I even tell the choir members, you know, if I'm doing something, if you hear something, I'm doing it, tell me. Let me, tell me I'm playing something wrong. They do it to me in my choir. Uh, Elder, I think we didn't do this last week. I think you did this. And then I'll listen to the recording. I said, you know, you're absolutely right. And I said, right in front of the whole choir, you know, being transparent is key. Being transparent, being humble, pouring into others, key. Because when you pour into others and you, as you're emptying out, God will pour more into you. I've learned that because I poured into many and given of myself to many. Um, ministries, church, people, um, whatever the case. And I find that God pour, still, still continues to point to me that I'm the I'm over 60. I'm just going to tell my age. I'm, they say black mm-hmm. don't crack. I'm going to tell my age. I'm 66 years old. Mm-hmm. Born in 1956. And uh, I always told God when I got in my 50s, I told God, I don't care if I'm 95, I don't care if I'm 100. I tell people that right now. Will me or push me to the organ or piano, I'm still going to play it. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because we should be always learning something new. Always. that, And I've learned that musicians, our mentality is different from the regular lay member. Um, We think differently. Um, We look at life a little differently, too. 
but sometimes the way we look at life can cause us um, pain because when you think high of yourself, um, you always find that somebody knows more than what you know. I've learned that it's always important to keep God first and keeping yourself a base, keeping myself a base and humble. Because when I do that, when I think that nobody's thinking about me or, you know, I'm just, you know, since I left Newark, I, I didn't leave Newark, but you know, since I left my church in Newark and I'm here, my home church, and I'm here in St. Paul, um, which is my home church too, because I did join some years back. Um, I don't really hear about things that's going on in the area like I used to. And I said, God, they probably forgot me, you know. And then I get phone calls, you know, like out the blue. Uh, Elder Lil, are you able to do this? Or can you do this? Or, you know, even Bishop, he called me. I was surprised when you reached out to me. You know, I said, wow, God, you know, you're still faithful. So I just, you know, do what I do and try to remain humble. Humble, being humble is the key. Loving people is the key. Knowing how to speak to people is the key. And also being able to take constructive criticism without having an attitude. Because, you know, musicians and singers, we are very touchy, touchy. Can't tell me how to play this. You can't tell me how to play this because I already know how to play that. But the only way to learn, you have to accept the criticism. You didn't play it right, Aunt Nell. You should do it. This, this last week we had our, um, our uh, North Jersey District Missionary Baptist Association um meeting um it's usually the whole week but you know because of covid it was wednesday thursday friday saturday so saturday and sunday is when we served our district and i have the privilege this is my first year as being the director of music over our district auxiliary music auxiliary mm -hmm. that was surprising to me as well but i thank god for the opportunity but we have an md young man his name is winston winston um Nelson, that's my grandbaby in the back, if you hear that noise. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, he's the MD. Now, I could tell him, I want you to play like this, but I allow him for his position to do what he does. If I think I should add something, I said, well, Winston, why do you think about this? He said, yeah, auntie, well, auntie, I think you should do it like this. And I listen to him. I don't feel intimidated. The key is intimidation can destroy you. Don't be intimidated. Learn. I'm going to say this to our older generation learn from the young people with their musicianship because they think differently, but also don't be intimidated. Go home and practice. That's what I do. If I hear something that's really awesome, I heard something on a service, I go home and try to, what did they just do? Oh, okay. You know, we have to be open to constructive, not damaging criticism, but constructive, constructive criticism. And I'm always open. I'm always open to learn something new so that can add to ministry, add to my career, add to um, my life. Because what I learned, if I could pass it on to somebody else, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. What chords that you played on now? This. Okay, go home and take it, practice it. Let me know how you came out with it. I'll show you some more, you know? And always be open to giving back because I've had in my past experiences when I was younger, asking people to show me this and that, oh, go practice your scales. Or, How did you do that run? Oh, I did da, 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 da. Don't show me nothing. Okay, what are those chords? Oh, this is this, that, that, that. Um, uh, uh, F 13, minor nine, raise seven, whatever. <laughs> Instead of just sitting down and showing me. And I know some people, I've had some friends recently tell me that have issue with you know asking a simple can you show me that and it's like you know shrug or hmm, that kind of thing we should always want to pour and give back to those who want to know who to those who want to know who are coming up because when i'm dead and gone life doesn't stop one monkey doesn't stop a show it life keeps going the music keeps evolving. And see, the music is evolving. One thing I learned, um, Andre, that music evolves. Yes. Just like back in the day, we were playing certain things and the old, the OGs that we used to call them, they didn't like because you shouldn't be playing all that fancy stuff. And it really wasn't fancy. It was just, we just you're playing correct. You're playing, you're trying to add to the service. But because it was new, 
like Oh Happy Day was new. It was shunned upon. Andre Krauss came out with new. He was kind of shunned, but then he was lifted because his music was so um, amazing. And others, Thomas Dorsey, okay? That's old school uh, stride ragtime. You know, they said, that's not of God. But he ended up being the father of gospel. Isn't that something? <laughs> that's really something. That's really something. So music is going to continue, continue to evolve. So we, as the older generation, have to accept that the music is evolving. So we need to be trying to catch up and still pour into our young people to let them know what the found what the deep roots are, because they're the new branches. So we, to let those branches grow and those those leaves to 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 cultivate, we have to pour into them. But they have to be able to listen. Very key. I remember I was at a GMWA uh, convention, maybe 2010, and we were practicing late night when we were talking about late one night, about one o'clock in the morning. And there were these young people. They were on uh, the organ, um, the XK3. I have an XK3 over here in the corner um, system. And they were, they were just playing around. But they had, had uh, transposed the organ. Why do you transpose the organ? <laughs> <laughs> yes they should not yes. Hammond should not make these the Suzuki should not make these organs transposable but anyway so the organ was like like two steps two half steps down and I said this don't fit the sound right you know it's transposed so I said young people please learn how to play in your keys so I guess the young man felt some kind of way oh you know I could do what I want to do that so you know he started talking like that Walter and them were coming in. They let him have it. <laughs> Do you know who you're talking to? And you need to go home and practice so you don't have to be transposing. Because, you know, transposing is a handicap. Oh, yeah. It's a handicap. And here, I'm going to play in B flat. And I think the song, they were in. No, I was going to play in C. And I think that the song was transposed down to A flat or something like that. But anyway. Wow. I'm just, I'm just yes. So I'm just saying that we have to be humble yeah. and be able to learn from each other. Youth and I call us season. We are the season saints. They're the youth, the up and coming. Take from us, learn from us. And we're learning from you. If we can do that, there should be no problems, you know, with us uh, building for, cause it's all about him. It's yeah. not about us. See, that's the key too. It's not about us. It's about the Lord who gave us these gifts. And these gifts were given to us that his house and that his people would be edified and blessed mm -hmm. and delivered and set free. And the music can set free if we allow it, if we take ourselves out of it and let God take control. Even if the music is programmed, cut, cut that click off, cut the Ableton off, cut the live off, cut the, uh, the logic off, and let's let's worship. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope with all of that wisdom, I pray that those that will hear this, those of you that have joined us, will take this and apply it. Just don't amen. Hear, just don't be a, a hero only, would be a doer. This is doer. so great. Yes. Listen, yeah. Elder, you have blessed us tonight. God bless you. And I can't thank you enough for spending this time and sharing your story. And of course, uh, being transparent, your testimony, mm -hmm. your story, and all that God has done and what God is doing and what he's going to do with your ministry. I mean, I always say the best is yet, yet to come. I mean, And I received that. Yes, yes. So listen, friends, thank you all for joining us, those of you it shared in the comment section. If you missed any part of this, it'll be on our pages and on our YouTube channel, Fellowship of Music and Arts. Amen. Certainly go and subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification bell. So anytime we go live with an interview such as this, you'll be able to join us. And maybe one day I'll be interviewing you right here on Spotlight Amen. on Music. Elder, I'm, I'm going to pray. Amen. And, yes. Um, and we'll be gone for tonight. 
Father, we thank you for this awesome opportunity of fellowship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the woman of God. We thank you for blessing her, gifting her, anointing her for such a time as this now. Jesus. We pray, God, if there be a need in her life, thank you, Jesus. that you supply all of her needs according to your riches and glory Jesus. by Christ Jesus. We pray Psalms 90 and 17. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon her. Establish the work of thy hands upon her. Yea, the work of thy hands establish thou it. Yes, so, Lord. Father, we pray that whatsoever uh, uh, Elder Linnell Andrews' hands touch, you will cause it to prosper in the master's name of Jesus. Thank you, we pray, God, that you'll cover her, her home, her family, and bless her music ministry. We thank you for what you've done in her, with her, and yes, for her. Now we Thank you. Pray, God, that you're going to continue to use her for your glory, that whatever you do through her, the Jesus. body of Christ will be blessed in the name of Jesus. In your name, Lord. And this is your servant's prayer, Jesus. all in the name of the Lord, and match this name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And Amen. thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Listen, <laughs> I've enjoyed you. I've enjoyed you. And we have to do it again. I told um, uh, uh, Clark Joseph and uh, oh yeah, Clark. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I had him on and uh -huh. then, um, uh, Jerome Farrell. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, all all old buddies uh, been on here. Quincy Field and Pam Davis. And we're gonna have to find a way to do a big big Zoom panel. Yes, and just reminisce and thank God yes. for where we are and where we're going. Well, you, friends, thank you all again. Bishop, can I say one thing? Yes. You know what I like? Yeah. We didn't have to play an instrument. We just talk. Yeah, I just want to talk, you know. <laughs> talk all the time. They want, if they want to hear all that, then catch us on one mm -hmm. of them programs. Amen. <laughs> they want us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this, this has been fruitful. Uh -huh. Been a blessing to me. And I pray that all of you have been blessed. And certainly we thank God for you joining us. Well. Till Thank next time, Bishop Andre Woods, I'm commanding the blessings of the Lord, the Lord. to overtake you till next time. Bless you. We stay in touch. God bless you.